Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, masterclass with Peter Fader. Hello, Pete. Hey, good to see you. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. This is wonderful to have you today. So uh, I will maybe quickly start introducing you and, uh, and then we'll kick off the session. So um, hello, everyone. Pete is an absolute honor and pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, customer value is a true passion, not to say an obsession for all of us here in our daily work and probably for many watching too. So thank you so much for being here. I cannot wait to dive into a discussion. But first, a quick intro for those of you who might not know you, Pete, and all your work yet. Pete, you're a professor of marketing at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, a place known for having the best business school in the country, but only, sorry about that, the second best football team. Uh, you hold, Pete, a PhD in marketing from the MIT Sloan School of Technology, and you're an expert in the analysis of behavioral data. Uh, we'll talk a lot about behaviors today, uh, aimed at understanding and forecasting customer purchasing behaviors. One might say that you are the alpha and the omega of customer lifetime value, but the company you co-founded in 2018 and which continues to run today is actually called Theta and advises businesses and investors through predictive customer and corporate valuation analysis. Previously, you had also co-founded Zodiac, a predictive customer analytics platform that was later acquired by Nike. And in more recent achievements, a few months ago, you published a book called The Customer Base Audit, the first step on the journey to customer centricity, which I hope we'll uh, get to hear more, more, more about today. Um, and here is the book, which uh, you should all, of course, um, get very, very soon. Um, and um, to... Uh, to conclude this, uh, Pete, we are just extremely excited to be able to share some time with you today and hear more about your work and your experience. So again, welcome and thank you. Oh, it is really my pleasure. I have such admiration for you personally, for, for your company, uh, for the all the things that you've done to take some of these ideas and, and make them available at, at full commercial scale and to popularize them. And even just conversations like this is something that, that I, I value greatly and I, uh, I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, uh, Pete. And uh, to kick off this session and moderate, if needed, the panel, uh, I will have the pleasure to speak with Annabelle Kranik. How are you doing, Annabelle, today? Very well. Thank you, Thibault. Hello, everyone. We're very happy to go through this insightful book today. And uh, to celebrate this unique session, I'm glad to announce our giveaway. So, as always, please ask any questions you might have in the comment sections and make sure to indicate your name so that you're eligible. After the webinar, a random draw will determine our five lucky winners. This is your opportunity to get the tool you need to take the first step on your journey to customer centricity. Um, and speaking of customer centricity, I will now pass the mic to Thibault to introduce the core topic, so where everything starts, the customer. Thank you, Annabelle. And to start, um, I wanted to mention this quote that I found in your book, Pete, products should be seen as a vital conduit of customer profitability, but ultimately it is the customer driving revenue, not the product. So I think it's all very clear here. There's no doubt about your customer orientation and uh, you, you put it uh, in a very nice way in, in the book. So uh, you describe what a customer centric company is with those four building blocks, right? Viewing the customer as a fundamental unit of analysis, having customer acquisition, retention and development as a core of any kind of organic growth, making decisions through the lens of long-term customer profitability and recognizing and acting on the fact that not all customers are created equal. This is the basic. And so Pete, a first question for you, since your last book uh, and the evolution of the everything as a service model, what you call the membership economy, what has been the evolution of customer centricity? It's been amazing. Uh, if you could have told me at the, at the time, especially that I wrote the first book, the, the white covered one back in 2011, uh, at the progress that we'd see 
uh, over the 12 years since then, I would not have believed you. Uh, and, and that progress uh, shows up in, in lots of different ways. Uh, number one, it's the, the, the number and breadth of firms that are really embracing this. So I think about this week alone, uh, I, I've had uh, you know, a number of conversations with, with different organizations. And to, just to single out three of them, uh, one of them is a, a very boring uh, industrial products company just selling something that, that most of us would just look at as kind of a, a pure uh, commodity good uh, in, in a business to business way. And, and I look at them and say, well, you know, why are you interested in this stuff? And the fact is they have customers, not all their customers are created equal. They're trying more and more to make the customer the unit of analysis. So it's great to see companies like that moving in this direction. Likewise, with a professional services firm, a law firm, uh, that, that ordinarily would, would have nothing to do with this kind of stuff, but they're realizing that it is vital to their uh, ongoing existence and growth. Uh, and third would be a credit union, uh, a, a company that, that uh, almost in contrast to the first two, prides itself on being very member driven, but at the same time has always done it in a rather vague way but they're starting to embrace the metrics and understand the fact that while they love all their members, they should love some more than others. So a wide variety of organizations waking up and moving in this direction, that's number one. Number two, just much more sophistication around the data, the models, the analytics, the forecasts. I mean, that's what I really do for a living. And it's just great to see how much genuine interest there is on the part of, of people to really embrace that stuff instead of just kind of casting it aside and leaving it up to the geeks and the nerds. And number three, uh, the, the broad interest in these same topics and methods across the organization, that it's not just the marketing people, but almost everybody in the organization is, is waking up to say, you know what, this is in my best interest too, whether I'm in marketing or finance or operations or supply chain or even HR and talent management. So uh, it's been a dream come true to watch the way that, that, that people have, have embraced these ideas. And, and as much progress as we've made, there's still much more room we need to cover and, and, and many more great stories uh, that we'll have a chance to tell. Absolutely. Thank you. And so let's dive into uh, our first chapter, which is about exploring revenue and profitability with your book with the customer base audit. Um, because your book is organized around the data cube and five lenses. So maybe you could tell us a bit more so that everyone has a, one more reason to go buy it. Sure thing. You know, in many ways, we're, we're just kind of formalizing what comes naturally to, to a lot of smart people and, and companies. So a, a lot of people are going to hear me talk about it and say, wait a minute, that's, that's not new. Um, and that's okay. That's good. We just want to find best practices that are out there and bring them together in kind of a natural framework, which gives us the five lenses. If you think about it, that no, no matter what platform you're using to store and analyze your data. Let's just think about an Excel spreadsheet, just because we can relate to that most easily. We have our rows, which would be the customers, and we have the columns, which would be uh, kind of what, what's going on over time. And so we have this, this big data set. Uh, and what the lenses tell us is just how we can slice that data set to get different kinds of perspectives. So, and I'll do it very, very quickly. Lens one is let's just take one vertical slice. Let's just look at one point in time across our customers and, and look at our customers and, and, and understand uh, that some of them buy a lot more than others, uh, that they, they have more transactions, they spend more when they do, that there, there's, some, there, there, there's nothing average about our customers and understanding the nature and extent of that spread, even just at a given point in time, is really vital and really eye-opening. It really starts to tell us that not all customers are created equal and we need to lean into that. So lens one is a vertical slice. Lens two would be two vertical slices. So a lot of companies like to look at same store sales or year over year uh, uh, outcomes. So let's just do that. Let's understand how that vertical slice changes when we uh, examine this group of customers in the next period, do they buy the same amount, more or less? Uh, and, and, and those differences, are there any systematic patterns to them and implications that arise from them? So the first two lenses are vertical slices, point in time or points in time across the customers. Lens three 
my favorite would be a horizontal slice. Let's take a group of customers who were acquired at roughly the same point in time and see what happens to them over time. How does their purchasing as a collective cohort change? Uh, and, and what patterns should we expect to see both in future periods for them as well as for other cohorts? And that takes us to lens four, is let's compare one cohort to another. Are they better? Are they worse? On what dimensions are they better or worse? And what does that all mean? And how is it impacted by things like seasonality and product launches and other kinds of external activities? That's lens four. And lens five is let's just bring it all together. Let's really understand the overall health of the customer base. But instead of just looking at it in one big, amorphous, messy data set, uh, let, let's do it in this more organized, systematic way. Lens five really pulls together the insights from and across the other four lenses to make these overall statements about how are we doing and how do we think we'll be doing in the future. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think actually I want to go back onto those horizontal slices that you called or your favorite because two out of those five lenses, as you mentioned, are centered around cohorts. So which is why we've included uh, one of the figures in the book. Uh, a customer cohort chart or a C3 as you beautifully name it and um, where we can identify for instance the volume of profit that new members generate um, but something you emphasize is the importance of clear terms so the wording might be different from one organization to another but each term must be very clearly defined and when using them consistency is key however the term that we often hear uh, from clients when describing different types of customers is personas or segments. Um, so as you mentioned the cohorts as maybe your favorite um, lens, uh, we'd like to invite you to open your heart. What would you like to share on this? this yeah, distinction? so that's, it's, it's a really important distinction. And Annabelle, you said it so perfectly that we need to be consistent. We need to be clear about these terms. And there's just too many people out there, even today, who use the words, let's say, cohort and segment interchangeably, thinking that, you know, uh, either way, it's just a slice of the customer base. Yeah, what's the difference? Well, there's a huge difference. And in fact, there's a complementarity between the two. So once again, as I said before, and you know yourself, but I want to make sure that everybody else uh, out there understands, uh, we're going to define a cohort as a group of customers who were acquired at the same time, at roughly the same time, you know, in a particular year or quarter, or maybe, depending on the industry, maybe even a, a particular day. Let's look at all those customers who share that kind of acquisition characteristic and just watch what happens to them over time. Now, of course, not all customers are created equal, even those customers acquired within a given point of time. So there's going to be heterogeneity. There are going to be differences within the cohort. And that's where segments come in. It's segments really help us resolve some of those differences. So let's understand that some customers are going to be great, some customers are going to be eh, and there'll be some customers in the middle. Uh, and so segments would be just, just uh, breaking customers down by, by other kinds of characteristics, not necessarily, in fact, probably not tied at all to when they're required, but more about their purchasing habits or maybe more about their personalities, maybe their demographics, maybe other kinds of characteristics that don't directly relate to, to their purchasing, but relate to you know who they are as a person and what makes them tick and what, what are they looking for and what are they frustrated by. That's where personas come in. As you said, personas would just be a, a very specific way of doing the segment thing. Uh, but again, segments, cohorts, different, complement uh, complementary to each other uh, really both very important parts of our marketing vocabulary but let's use them precisely let's use them accurately and let's use them appropriately thank you so much Pete this is very clear about cohorts but Pete come on you're the guru you're sitting in your in your Wharton office today in Philadelphia you're the guru of CLV and surprisingly now you seem to be preferring the concept of value to date which you mentioned in your book and profitability what happened to you pete well i've i've uh you know you talked you asked earlier about uh, changes in my kind of understanding of, of customer centricity over the you know dozen or more years since i started writing these books uh, way back then I was young and naive. Now I'm just old and naive. Um, and I believe that if I could just give everyone 
the CLV model or the magic wand that I can wave over each customer's head and get that future predicted profitability that life would be good. But there's been some understandable resistance along the way. Uh, now, there are a lot of people, a lot of companies like yourselves who get it and, and don't need their hands held and don't need anything to be clarified. Uh, and they really appreciate lifetime value and really care about it and think about it very, very seriously, very carefully, very rigorously. But there's a bunch of folks out there who still don't quite understand. Uh, either they, they just don't understand the definition or they're skeptical about it or they, they're, they're skeptical about the concept, they're skeptical about the methods. So in that spirit of let's walk before we can run, instead of just running ahead with predictive lifetime value, let's just get the conversation started with how profitable the customers have been so far. I mean, that's the whole point of the new book overall, not just with respect to lifetime value, is let's just look at the data that we have. Let's understand the patterns. Let's understand how those patterns vary across groups of customers, across periods of time, and so on. Uh, and, and that by itself is going to be incredibly insightful, even before we start doing any predictions, even before we start building models and bringing in scary Greek letters and math and stuff like that. So it really is walk before we run. In fact, I'll, I'll kind of take exception a bit with the wording here. It's not that I prefer value to date over lifetime value. It's just that I want to start with it, especially for folks who have some hesitation, some skepticism. Let's start with value to date. Once you see the patterns in your own data set, again, before you run any models or anything, and you see them and say, oh my gosh, some of these customers are much more valuable than others. And we see these interesting patterns about how they change over time. I wonder what they're gonna do next. I wonder how these patterns are gonna persist. That's where the models come in. That's where the predictions come in. That's where lifetime value comes in. So it really is just, just understanding a natural sequence to get people on board before they, they, they go for kind of the, the risky, more complex uh, forecasting models. I'm just, I'm just learning as I go here. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think people find that helpful. Thank you so much. No, this is uh, very reassuring and, uh, and and thank you so much. So uh, talking about uh, values, uh, you know companies, they need to impact revenues and profitability. And for that, uh, the customer base audit is a very precious thing for sure. So um, we wanted to maybe uh, start this second chapter with uh, customer acquisition. I know you're not talking so much about customer acquisition in your book, but still it often starts like this. And so I wanted to take the example of a dating website. You know, it was Valentine's Day yesterday, so it's a very hot topic. Uh, there are a number of steps that one needs to, to take in order to uh, to register and become a, a customer of a dating website, right? You first maybe visit the website, you maybe uh, register at some point, then you fill in your profile, you maybe add a picture, and then maybe you become a paying customer. So, Pete, at which point would it be fair to say that the customer has been acquired? I love this question because, again, it reflects a lot of evolution in my own thinking. So uh, so in, in some of the earlier books and even in a full semester course that I teach on this topic of you know managing customer relationships, I have a whole session that focuses just on this issue. So whether it's with a dating website or some kind of you know, a, a tech-based SaaS platform or something, we ask exactly the kind of questions you raised and say, you know, what point can we say the customer's been acquired? Because um, I'm always looking for answers. I'm always looking, just like when we're talking about cohorts and segments, we want crisp distinction. Um, and so I spend a lot of time trying to figure out where to draw the line. And a couple of things have happened along the way. Uh, one is that there's just so many different factors at play again you just identified a few of them that it's it's just it's it's hard to say and getting harder all the time and then to answer it on kind of an even more meta level again coming back to the new book in chapter one we ask the more fundamental question is this person a customer or not so just because they bought stuff from us just because they're included somewhere in the you know the company's crm system 
in their mind, they might not be a customer. In their mind, it might be, well, you know, I paid you the money for that product or service. It was a fair exchange. I have my stuff. You have my stuff. There's no relationship here. We, we had an exchange. doesn't mean that we're dating or married or anything. So even if an exchange has taken place, even if, if money has been paid, yes, an acquisition has happened, but it doesn't mean that the customer has been acquired. So I actually like to, to focus on that more fundamental issue. If you think about all the different products and services that you own and that you, you know, carry around and, and use and talk about, for how many of those things are you genuinely a customer or not, whether the company thinks that way about you? Uh, and so I, I really love uh, answering, uh, or not even answering, but asking that question and having that same debate as I had with my co-authors and we'll have with our students. Uh, so, it's, so it's less about uh, where do we draw the line on when you've been acquired and more about, you know, uh, have you been acquired at all? And even if you have been, are you still an acquired customer or is the relationship over despite the fact that you might still be using the products and services? So in some sense, I'm, I'm A, avoiding the question <laughs> and B, kind of complicating it, which I don't like. Again, I like crisp, yes, no, black, white answers. But in a situation like this, I think it's important for us to to acknowledge that there are no easy answers uh, and, and we don't want companies to uh, you know, overstate the nature of those relationships or overcount the number of customers. Uh, it would be great if down the road we could agree on certain kinds of standards and guidelines to say, yes, you are, no, you're not. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could have you know, an, an industry committee to kind of convene and, and figure this stuff out. Uh, so I love these conversations, but I, I think that we're still pretty far. And the more we talk about it, maybe even getting further from uh, have, having crisp answers to, to, to questions like these. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have the conversations. Thank you. So if we move forward a bit, uh, you know, companies are also worried about the percentage of one and done customers. As you highlight in your book, we can see here on this uh, nice uh, figure uh, that um, one cohort of customers acquired in uh, Q1 2016. Uh, we, we look, you look uh, for the Madrigal company in your book um, at uh, whether they bought, um, you know, in 2016 and how many people bought each year and and we end up with a seven percent of the initial cohort which actually purchased each year after the initial purchase and 45 percent i think of the total um uh, people in this cohort actually did not purchase anymore so these one and done customers um they uh you know keep everyone awake at night sometimes is it so bad doctor and uh, is it bad if uh, companies are obsessed with driving the second purchase, uh, you know, sometimes with bribing uh, their customers? What's your take on this? Oh, well, so let me first back up. And, and first, uh, I, I, I love this issue. Uh, acknowledging the, the existence and that tremendous number of one and done customers, uh, even though they tend to be our worst customers, it's an important fact. And, uh, and, and every company should be looking at their data exactly through this kind of lens and just recognizing that many, many customers are going to be one and done. Don't take that as a point of failure. Don't take that as a personal shame. It's just a natural kind of law of gravity type thing. This is the way it always works. So, so for one thing, uh, you know, don't, don't, cry over it don't you know at the same time don't don't celebrate it <laughs> you definitely want to do something about it um but but don't feel that there's any kind of failure there and with that in mind um it, while of course it's desirable to to get customers to to buy from you that second time but when you see that word obsession over there obsessions are rarely good uh and i remember talking to a, a company over there in europe actually in the nordics that has this idea of, you know, percent of, of new customers making their second purchase in a particular period of time, really as kind of a, a, a as an obsession, as a, a major North Star metric that even the CEO can quote on, on a regular basis. And on one hand, I'm thinking, that's kind of cool that the CEO can quote these kinds of repeat purchasing metrics. But on the other hand, as desirable as it is to see 
uh, companies driving to maintain ongoing relationships uh, with their customers. When we start to obsess over metrics like this one and others, dare I say, net promoter score, um, then the, the meaningfulness of that metric and the actions associated with it start to become kind of dangerous because then we start to take on activities just to meet this hurdle. Uh, and sometimes it might mean bribing. Sometimes it might mean just, just bad allocations of funds that don't have good long-term consequences. So rather than just looking around and saying, huh, if we can acquire a better set of customers, a larger proportion of them will make that second purchase and let's continue to acquire those kinds of customers. But if we try to artificially manipulate it, um, that's probably not the way to achieve customer-centric success. So again, I love the metric. It really is a good yardstick of how we've been doing, but that metric shouldn't become a, a, a hard goal that we incentivize uh, people to achieve, which then leads to, to more short-term uh, oriented outcomes with, with uh, some negative long-term consequences. Absolutely, thank you. Annabelle? Yes, I think this is something that can actually really help companies ask the right questions. And that's why we've also gathered some of the insights that the customer base audit actually enables. So the first is something that you've already mentioned, and we notice it in particular when we bring back the third dimension, so the product dimension, and we break down this like organization performance into category performance, for instance, and realize that not all customers are created equal. And then similarly, we realize that there's little stability uh, among customers. So meaning that a customer active in one period won't necessarily be active in the next. And it can actually be reassuring, as you're saying, to know that it's a normal pattern and it's something that is often observed. And then the third insight is a little reminder that the order of the letters in the RFM analysis is actually not a coincidence and that monetary value, yes, is certainly a key indicator, but it comes after recency and frequency. And then in the end, um, what we remember is that the book really encourages uh, to celebrate heterogeneity. Um, so it comes to with the realization that there is no average customer. Um, so rather than looking at the aggregated values, we need to decompose. And for instance, one way to do this is uh, the de decile analysis. So we can try to understand how top deciles are different from the lower ones. And it's actually one of the most frequently asked questions in terms of which actions to take. How do we retain that first decile? Um, so we actually have two questions on that topic. Since you were very careful about the R word, uh, could you please explain maybe in what context it might be appropriate? And then um, if you have any, uh, what are the recommendations to efficiently retain those high value customers? Oh, there's so many good things baked into this question over here. Uh, uh, where do we begin? Uh, I like how you put retain in quotes because uh, companies feel that they can, they manage the relationships with their customers, that it's kind of up to them to retain the customers, you know, that we are proactively choosing to retain you as opposed to saying the customer likes us, they want to be around, you know, almost independent of anything that we do as long as we don't screw it up. Um, so in some sense, a lot of what we call retention is just happening quite naturally as, as customers just, just doing their thing, whether we're reminding them, whether we're showing them the love, whether we're sending them personalized messages, uh, you know, if if it's a, if it's a healthy relationship, we don't need to do much at all. In fact, it might be best if we get out of the way. A really great example of this is some some wonderful work by my academic granddaughter, <laughs> Ava Escarza. Um, so again, on on the book by my co-author and you know very very good friend Bruce Hardy his P, his former phd student Ava Escarza who's now just a very uh, famous professor at the Harvard Business School uh, she has a wonderful paper where she looks exactly at this issue where a company wants to be very careful about its retention so they go to their best customers and say you know you're not on the best possible plan. That actually, if, we, if you switch over to this other plan, it's in a telecommunications setting, um, you know, you'll, you'll save money. You'll get more value for your dollar. Uh, and that sounds great, right? You know, every company should be out there doing this kind of thing, except for one thing. Once you kind of, you know, kind of poke the sleeping bear, 
once you kind of get people to start to question the plan that they have with you, then they might question it more broadly instead of, you know, it should be this plan or this plan. It might be, is it this provider or some other provider? And so you end up actually increasing churn because you're trying to proactively manage retention. And so there's, there's all kinds of issues about the way that we talk about retention, about the way that we engage in it. Uh, and then the last part I want to talk about is the word before retain. And, and I don't know whether it was just kind of, you know, you threw it out there casually, Annabelle, or I don't know if it was something that you did deliberately. The E word, efficiently. Should we be managing our customer relationships in an efficient manner? Now, maybe for the so-so customers, the ones who aren't worth that much, the ones who, no matter what we do, are going to leave pretty quickly, sure, we shouldn't overspend on them. But for those really valuable customers, that long right tail of high CLV customers, their efficiency might actually get in the way. We should be asking the question more, can we effectively retain those customers? Because those customers are so valuable that efficiency should be the last thing on our mind. We should pay pretty much anything to make sure that those customers stay around and keep doing what they're doing. So we want to be careful in general about managing the different marketing functions from a cost minimization standpoint. It's all about value maximization, which means we shouldn't be afraid to spend. We should be able to go to the CFO and say, this is going to be worth it and I can prove it to you. So in many cases, efficiency is actually gets in the way of creating and harvesting long-term value. Great. So talking about actions, marketing actions, Byron Shop, the great Byron Shop, said most brand buyers are light occasional customers, yet they still account for 40% of long-run turnover. So the old strategy, target your loyalists for efficiency, looks like a near complete dead end, he says. What do you think? And how would you prioritize speed between what you call the vital fuse and the useful main? Oh, Byron Sharp, Byron Sharp. I am his biggest advocate, probably in the in the, in the entire uh, Americas. Uh, I, 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 I highly recommend his books. You can see I have multiple copies of his books right up there. Um, it's as, about as close to a textbook for my course as there is. Um, uh, you know, 90% of what he talks about in how brands grow is right on the money, despite how counterintuitive a lot of it is. But I go a little bit further. In other words, I believe in, in all of the models, the Dirichlet multinomial model that Byron and, and uh, kind of his predecessor, uh, Andrew Ehrenberg, uh, did such a great job of, of popularizing and communicating. Um, but it turns out there's more than that. And in the models as Byron and Andrew deploy them, they often undervalue those high value customers. So you see this, this, this 40% number in the quote over here. When you do the analysis carefully and properly, when you add in just a couple of other small bells and whistles, uh, the, those that, that Andrew and Byron would actually rather just ignore, but they're actually really, really important if we want to use these models from a forecasting standpoint. If we really want to predict the long run value of customers and want to do it properly, it turns out that they will tend to uh, uh, significantly understate the value of those high value customers. So again, I believe in, in everything they talk about, which is uh, you know uh, make the brand broadly appealing, focus on the principles of double jeopardy, that, that uh, penetration and purchase frequency are linked together, all of that. 100% agree, but I do think that they undervalue uh, the, the, those high value customers. Doesn't necessarily mean that they that we have to abandon the kinds of strategies that, that Byron advocates, that for most of our customers, again, just being broad, being, uh, uh, you know, mental availability, uh, uh, being at arm's length in a, in a retail setting, um, a use of mass media, I believe in all that. But for those high value customers, they do deserve a little bit of extra treatment. Uh, they do deserve a little bit more mindset on the part of senior management. They do deserve a little bit more, um, you know, uh, TLC uh, when it comes to to uh, to what other products and services that they might be buying. So, um, so, so there, there, there's some disagreement, but it really is at the margin. And for the most part, again, big advocate of of everything that that Byron says. Right. 
Thank you so much. So um, it, it's um, it's a master class. So drink some water because you need it. Ah. And oh, no, I'm this... drinking water because I want to celebrate the picture that you're about to talk about now. Yes, please celebrate and explain. I because, sure will. Because this figure 5.8, you need to explain us. And by the way, there's a nice quote you have which is underlying differences across customers often proves to be a stronger and a more enduring effect than marketing actions. So, Pete, now you don't believe in marketing actions anymore? Is oh. that what we should understand, oh. please? Guys, um, all right. So first, let's explain the picture. Th this, this picture changed my life. Um, this is a picture that uh, was first developed uh, by a gentleman named Jerry Eskin. A name that probably like no one listening to this might recognize, but you know his work. Um, he was one of the co-founders of IRI, of Information Resources Incorporated. Before that, um, he uh, was a uh, he was at uh, at at uh, Pillsbury, uh, you know, the, the the biscuit company here in the U.S. Um, and uh, and and in, in in one of his CPG roles, he actually. Um, looked at repeat buying patterns over time. That's exactly what's going on here. If we ask ourselves, of all the people who first buy our product, what percent of them make their second purchase five, 10, 20, 30 weeks after that initial purchase? So the key is that on the X axis, I know it might be hard for people to see, uh, it's, it's not just calendar time, it's time since the previous purchase. And so we ask ourselves, if we line up all of those first time buyers, and ask ourselves how many of them will buy, you know, as we move ahead from that first purchase, whenever that first purchase occurred, you see that lower line. And then the line above it would be, after people have made their second purchase, how quickly, if ever, will they make their third purchase? And so on and so on and so on. And when you look at these curves, you see this beautiful regular pattern that as we go to higher and higher levels of repeat buying, as we go from first to second, second to third, third to fourth, it shouldn't come as a surprise that a greater percentage of customers are going to achieve that next level of repeat. If I asked you, you know, of all the people who have made their ninth repeat purchase, what percent of them will eventually make their 10th repeat? You'll say, well, it's going to be nearly 100%. These are the people who are locked in. And that's exactly what this picture shows us. Some amazing regularity. Again, this is a big tribute to Jerry Eskin. And in the data set that we use in the book, we see exactly the same patterns. And for me personally, the life-changing moment was in the uh, mid to late 1990s when that whole um, internet thing, that uh, e-commerce dot com thing was just starting. And we all believed that it was different. The world is changing. And the way that Amazon and eBay and some of these companies that no longer exist um, were operating is doesn't doesn't fit the rules of marketing and customer behavior. Well, it turns out that the rules are the same. It turns out that the patterns that you see in this chart are really universal. It's amazing how regular these patterns hold. Uh, and so it's really important for people just to see them. Again, no models no predictions, just plot out the data in the manner described here, and you'll see these patterns yourself. And that gets to the kind of main point of your, you know, in intentionally provocative question, which is not to say that marketing uh, doesn't work and that marketing actions are a waste of time and money. We're not saying that at all. But you are saying that there are some very regular baseline behaviors that we should expect to see. And again, when you see how regular these curves are, you're realizing that this is this is kind of baked into customer behavior. And and then marketing does two things. Number one, it just helps lock these patterns in. Uh, and, and in many ways goes back to Byron Sharp that we need to kind of keep up that cadence of marketing uh, and just to kind of make sure that things are operating the way that they've always operated, even if that doesn't necessarily move the needle in any kind of different way. But then number two, Marketing can move the needle in a different way. And if we run some kind of campaign, or if we acquire a different set of customers, or we move into a different geographic area, and we start to see that the patterns deviate from what you see right here, that's going to tell us that marketing is actually doing something for us. So the main point is, it's important for us to set the baseline to have these really strong expectations about what will probably happen 
not so much in the absence of marketing, but in the absence of any unusual marketing. What should we expect to see? So if we do some unusual marketing, we can we, we can appreciate the, the delta, the difference from those baselines. And patterns like this one, this beautiful picture over here is a great way to set some of those baseline expectations. Thank you so much. Uh, this is all very clear now, and this takes us already to our third chapter, because you say in your book that unashamedly, uh, you want to be descriptive and have a descriptive approach. I will ask you, Pete, in an unashamedly manner that companies would like to know how they should try to maybe predict values anyway. And um, so, Annabelle. Yes, if we're talking about prediction, we must talk about the customer lifetime value. Uh, so the present uh, value of future cash flows associated with the customer. And there are several ways to model it, but we've chosen one um, seemingly easy way, which is this formula. Um, and so there are several input variables needed over a specific time period, such as the price paid by the customer, the cost of servicing and acquisition, for example. Um, but first of all, there are big differences in data availability across organizations, um, which is often linked to a specific industry, but even with this information at their disposal, the main challenge remains this little R that we're seeing here predicting repurchase, um, which we've just seen actually depends on the number of purchases um, in the beautiful picture that we've previously looked at. Um, and you've also mentioned that we often underestimate the value of the top customers. Um, so since this is often a long and hard journey for companies, we're wondering, do you think companies should keep working on predicting CLVs? Oh, of course they should. Again, got to walk before you run. Let's first look at our data. Let's first look for those patterns. Let's understand what they mean. Let's actually start to take action on the unashamedly descriptive data that we have before we start coming up with the predictions. But but coming up with the predictions is going to be very important. It's, it's going to be important for us to be able to take actions, to evaluate those actions, and to convince our other stakeholders that what we're doing isn't beneficial just for the here and now, but that we can do a better job of forecasting revenue over longer horizons more accurately and, and so on. So, so whether we're doing it at the granular level of CLV or doing it at the more aggregate level for the, for the firm as a whole, kinds of things we do in my firm on customer-based corporate valuation. Um, but one of the problems is that we kind of put this formula in front of a lot of people um, and say, this is the CLV formula. Now, Annabelle, you said it very carefully. You said there's a lot of different ways to do it. It's going to depend on the business setting. But for too many companies, they, they don't hear that part of the message. And they think that this is the CLV formula. And then they have a real hard time figuring out how to make it work for, for their kind of business. And so one of the things that I like to emphasize in so much of the academic work, as well as the books, is that there's no one size fits all CLV formula. Having said that, it's, it's not necessarily a unique bespoke CLV formula for every company either. So there's that just right middle ground. There's about four or five different CLV models, depending on whether it's a subscription business or a, or a discretionary business depending on whether we just have basically one product or service or a portfolio of products and services. So that's my job is to come up with the set of different CLV formulas, <coughs> excuse me, and then teach people how to match them up against the data that they have in order to, to bring it to life. There are challenges there. Uh, and so a lot of companies would either rather ignore the whole thing or just stick with the descriptive alone, say, I don't want to do the math. Uh, and it's our job. To, to motivate them to say, um, not only do you have to, but you want to. You want to show and appreciate the full value of your customer base, not just what you've seen so far. You're leaving money on the table otherwise. You're undervaluing your marketing efforts if you don't do it. And so, yes, we really want to keep on predicting CLVs and we want companies to, again, to do it carefully, uh, uh, accountably, and, and kind of, you know, enjoyably instead of uh, doing it uh, uh, as if, you know, someone's holding a gun to their head. We want them to, 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 to lean forward and embrace it and, and really, uh, you know, understand the math as much as they need to and to get their stakeholders to, to understand and appreciate it as well. And now 
the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> Peter, you actually did a little teaser earlier when talking about obsession with metrics. Um, we've come to a key moment of this masterclass, and it's with great honor that I get to ask this question. So please pay close attention. On a scale from one to 10, how likely are you, Peter Fader, to recommend NPS to a friend or colleague? Well, just like I said with Byron Sharp earlier, uh, I, I feel the same way about Net Promoter Score, which is I love it. I, I think about, uh, forget about the way that companies use it, which for the most part, I don't like, but think about its origins. Think about that wonderful book over there that Frederick Reichheld wrote back in 1996 called The Loyalty Effect. Frederick Reichheld, uh, the, the one of the, the, the Bain consultants who first came up with this idea and really did a great job of popularizing it. He, he in that book written, many, many years ago, 27 years ago, um, was saying basically the same kinds of things that, that I've been saying and I get too much credit for, which is not all customers are created equal. If we can figure out who those really valuable customers are, they're going to stay with us a long time. They're going to buy everything. They're going to be wonderful. They're going to be cheap to serve. They're going to advocate us to everybody else. Um, and he just looked around to try to find a metric that would kind of capture that. And that's where NPS came in. So in many ways, just like that, you know, getting customers to buy twice metric that we discussed before, and indeed I did connect NPS with that. Um, sometimes we find metrics that do a really good job of describing how well we're doing something. I love the idea of net promoter score. I love the idea that instead of saying, how satisfied is the average customer? Because there is no average customer. We're going to say, you know, how many do we have at the far right end of the spectrum and how many are at the left end of the spectrum? Let's just focus on the difference. Let's celebrate heterogeneity. So when you really think about what NPS is all about and where it comes from, it's amazing. And I think that Fred Reicheld and his partner in crime, Rob Markey, uh, they themselves have done such a good job of communicating it and popularizing it. Um, I mean, in many ways, my own work on lifetime value and customer-based corporate valuation, I aspire to have even a fraction of the success that they've had. You know, going back to a point I said before, we want CEOs to have customer metrics in their mind and to use those to, to kind of gauge the businesses and make comparisons across business units and so on. NPS has achieved that. And so that's amazing. Now, the issue is that once companies get this tool and once they turn it instead of just a diagnostic metric into a goal, we must achieve NPS 50 in the next year, that's when things go off the rails. And again, Reichheld and Markey will be the first to acknowledge that. And in some ways, they, they almost resent it because it, there's a lot of people out there who are big NPS haters and I bet a lot of listeners were thinking I was going to be on that bandwagon myself. Um, and so let's kind of separate out the metric from the misuse of it. But, you know, if we think about the metric and its origins, 10 out of 10, uh, NPS all the way. Thank you, Pete. By the way, uh, one of our very smart uh, PhD students at the moment at Numbery is currently working on micro behaviors around answering surveys and comparing it to the actual answers that uh, consumers provide within NPS surveys. And I, I won't, I won't uh, spoil everything, but uh, we have some very nice results that should be published very soon. Uh, Pete, we have so many questions. It's crazy. So uh, we still have some time to ask them. Um, so I will, I will maybe start with, uh, with one question that was, uh, that was asked uh, um, by Patrick W. He says, hi, Pete, Patrick W. from H&M here. What are your top three favorite examples from businesses that have successfully managed to implement a customer-centric approach? Sure thing, Patrick. It's, it's, it's wonderful to, to hear from you. I'm, I'm glad you're, you're tuned in here. Um, so, you know, I, I love to, uh, to to sing the praises of, of companies that have been doing this stuff well. And I really have got, gone to, to great efforts, especially in book number two about that. Um, and the, the company that I'm always starting off with is Electronic Arts, the gaming company. And even though some of those stories are now getting on 10 plus years old, uh, it, it's kind of amazing, first of all, I, I just how successful 
they were at, at getting you know the the CEO Andrew Wilson on board with it, of 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 getting the the people in R and D to really have customer value or customer value differences in mind, um, and how some of those practices have now carried over to other seemingly unrelated organizations. So again, in the same way that I'll praise Electronic Arts, a lot of that work was was engineered by a gentleman named. Zachary Anderson, who was their chief data analytics officer, and today he's in that same role at NatWest Bank over in the UK and doing amazing things over there. Uh, so it's 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 nice to know that we can take some of these best practices and and carry them with us uh, and and adapt to different kinds of businesses and adapt to different kinds of data structures and different kinds of of, of pressing managerial questions. So it just shows the overall robustness of this approach, that it doesn't only apply for one kind of company and, and one kind of decision. Uh, it's wonderful to see that. Uh, you'll see a lot of other companies um, um, a, a roll with the changes, sometimes you know, taking a step back. In book number one, you know, praising companies like um, uh, Caesars Entertainment uh, that, 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 bought, um, uh, that bought Harris, the casino chain, largely because of their successful use of, of, uh, of, of lifetime value and so on. And, and Tesco, the grocery retailer uh, over in the UK. But, uh, but both of those companies and others, uh, after finding great success, then for one reason or another, sort of take a step back, take a hit downwards. Maybe it's because competition's catching up. Maybe it's because the way that they're approaching it is getting a little bit stale and needs to be refreshed. So it's, it's important to know this, that even when you find initial success doesn't mean that you're locked in forever. I love a lot of the stuff going on at H&M right now, since you raised it, Patrick. Um, uh, but, but knowing that it, it's never just a, a straight linear upwards journey, there's always going to be kind of, you know, uh, ups and downs, uh, uh, back and forth. Uh, and I think just having both the, the personal resilience as well as the corporate culture that, that's going to enable you to kind of take some of those hits, learn from them, and actually make even better improvements than if you didn't have that, that step back in the first place. I think this kind of meta learning, not just, you know, here's the formula, use it, but, but how we continue to learn and evolve that's going to be the next generation. That's what we're going to see over the, the, these next 10 years uh, as we go from kind of anecdotes of customer-centric success to ongoing, you know, decades-long strategies embracing it. Thank you. Annabelle, you have another question for us? Yes, I mean, I'd like to ask Peter the most liked question, actually, question that William asked. Um, what is the place of relationship quality in your models? How do you determine the quality of the relationship with only behavioral and customer value? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question because sometimes the behavioral data alone, transaction log data alone, doesn't show you the full value of the relationship. So sometimes we're kind of, I, I, to say forced is too strong a word, but we desire to bring in additional metrics that might tell us not just about, you know, the customer lifetime value, but the nature, the health of the overall relationship. So as one example, uh, if, if we're in some kind of subscription setting where the transactions that we'll have with the customer are few and far between, it's like, you know, just are they making their regular you know, renewal payment or not. But if we start to look at how often they're engaging with us. So if we're, say, a performing arts organization, yes, it's great if they renew and, and we retain them. Terrific. But, you know, how many uh, how many concerts are they going to uh, and, and, and so on? Uh, so, so sometimes looking at the maybe the, the things that don't necessarily contribute directly to lifetime value, but do contribute to the health of the relationship, uh, we should be tagging and tracking those as well. And this is where something like net promoter score can come in, where sometimes bringing in those kinds of attitudinal metrics, whether it is NPS or whether it is some kind of other score around customer experience and so on, just to start asking questions and to start uh, understanding I don't want to say qualitatively, but attitudinally, uh, you know, it, it, do we see relationship health that seems to align with or maybe shed light on what we see purely in the transaction log data? 
Now, I'll be the first to admit that for, for me, it's mostly about the transaction logs and the billing statements. But if we really want to take action on it and really understand what's going on, we do need to bring in some of that other data as well on top of the models in order to, to really be able to, to take the right actions uh, and, and kind of you know, just, just better understand what's truly going on holistically and not just transactionally. Thank you, Pete. Uh, we are honored uh, to have uh, in, in this uh, discussion some um, some famous attendees like uh, Joel Rubinson, uh, who uh, who is um, by the way he says uh, on the chat that he's old enough to know Jerry Huskin. and uh, he asked a, 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 a very interesting question. He says, uh, Pete, all evidence I have seen shows heavier customers are hyper responsive to advertising. How can you recommend leaving them alone in light of this evidence? Yeah, that's a, 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 first of all, Joel, it's, it's wonderful to have you with us. And I really admire a lot of the work that you've been doing all of these years and, and some of your, your, your current work, which is just really, really, really uh, a, a thoughtful and, and, and unique. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a real delicate balance with those high value customers that on one hand, We'd prefer to kind of leave them alone and not get in the way and not risk, you know, waking up the sleeping bear. But on the other hand, uh, we don't want to ignore them completely because, A, there might be additional value that we can create for them and squeeze from them. Um, or, B, uh, it might be the case that they're, you know, getting a little bit either unhappy or that they feel that the relationship is stale. And it's like, you know, does the company like me or not? How come they're ignoring me? Um, so, you know, finding out that the just right way to, to kind of keep an eye on those customers and maintain a relationship with them without annoying them, without, uh, you know, spamming them. Uh, one of the things that I love is the idea of strategic account management. We'll see it all the time in a business to business setting where, you know, we'll have someone who'll basically, in some sense, babysit those high value customers just to keep an eye on them, you know, just to maybe suggest something to them, but doing it in kind of a, in a gentle, you know, truly personalized way instead of just, you know, sending a lot of, a lot of email. I'd love to see uh, consumer oriented companies adopt some of those practices. You know, we'll see some, some of that sometimes in, in a more, you know, upscale retail setting, where you know where a, a luxury firm or a you know high-end department store might assign that personal shopper to you just to kind of keep an eye on you. Is there anything I can help you with? Um, and I think that sort of thing, which doesn't really scale very efficiently, but for the high-end customers, can be extremely valuable as a way to kind of keep it personal, but avoid being annoying. I think I, I like to see more and more companies investing in that kind of practice because again, expensive but can be very value maintaining and enhancing. Absolutely. Annabelle, you have a last Thank question you. for Pete? Yes, one last one. Um, Eglantina is asking or is saying, hi, Peter, building on what we've discussed so far, customer acquisition, what happens after? So lifetime value, et cetera. What do you think will replace the customer journey framework? Well, for one thing, I'm, I'm often skeptical about the customer journey framework. I mean, the, the whole idea that our customers go through some kind of journey and it's important for us to understand, anticipate and react to it is, is great. But too often when I see companies implement it, sometimes it's, it's, it's oversimplified when they say, what is the customer journey? Well, right there, it goes completely against the grain of everything we believe in, heterogeneity. Or to say, well, we have three different kinds of customer journeys. Even that doesn't necessarily do justice to it. And then the last part is, very often, there are aspects of the customer journey that we as the company can't necessarily see or measure. So it could be just other things that the customers are doing with each other, with others, things that, that where they're not registering with us and it doesn't show up on our radar. So very often, no matter how much we invest in it, our understanding of the customer journey is, is going to be just uh, necessarily incomplete. There's a separate tangent anyway. So um, I, I don't think that, I don't, I don't know if, if this is the way that the question was intended, but it, 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 it almost implies that there's some kind of, you know, flavor of the month faddishness to customer lifetime value and customer centricity and some other shiny object will replace it. Um, I hope that's not the case. <laughs> I hope that, you know, going back to the very first quote that, that, that we saw on the, on the first slide, 
the idea that, yeah, you know, products and services are a conduit to value, but ultimately it's all about the customers. I hope that we'll never, ever, ever pivot away from that. And we're just finally starting to pivot into it because of the data that we have and, and the, the, the necessity to understand customers. And I think that once you start to really see and understand customers and appreciate the metrics and the practices, that you never grow out of it. Uh, and I hope that things like lifetime value will become so commonplace that we no longer have to have discussions about should we calculate it or not, um, that it will be that the calculating customer lifetime value will be as easy as calculating the costs of customer acquisition, something that we kind of, you know, almost take for granted and, and just, you know, never, never, never really question. So I think we're moving into a new era where we'll just kind of adopt these practices. Um, and, you know, when, when today's kids become tomorrow's CEOs, I think we're going to be in really amazing shape in this regard. Thank you so much, Pete. Uh, thank you for putting all your energy in, uh, you know, helping, uh, uh, you know, grow uh, uh, data literacy and uh, and in customer orientation. Um, this is really um, priceless for our industry and and our businesses. Uh, we're absolutely convinced about this, and uh, and thank you so much for for just uh, you know uh, spending the time and uh, and putting all your 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 efforts uh, in this in this amazing book which again uh, everyone should have i think so some of you will uh, will get a free one because of their great question thank you all of you for for being with us today um uh, we will uh, see you very soon i'm sure you can register to our upcoming webinars on different topics critical ones as well gender equity diversity and tech uh, march 7 with elizabeth vasquez and mile gave ceo of techstars so you can uh, you know scan the code here or click on the link on your page and uh, we will have also eric valla april 12 ceo of remy cointreau who just made an um, unbelievable um, and uh, during the Super Bowl. So Pete, thank you so much, really. It was a pleasure. We could have gone on and on and on because of so many questions. Uh, apparently uh, the audience loved it. Thank you so much, Pete. My pleasure, thank you. See you everyone, bye.